to God. Well, welcome everybody, strength and honor to you, and uh, I greet you in Jesus' joy tonight. It's good to see everybody <clears throat> on the line tonight, and um, he, indeed, as the song was declaring, uh, and there's a line in there where it says that the heavens are telling the earth how great our God is, and I believe that we're living in those days <clears throat> and times where we are seeing and hearing, we're seeing the signs and the wonders and miracles um, that the earth is getting the notification that God is great and that God is in the midst of performing the words uh, that he has spoken. And so we're grateful tonight. And uh, when we when we realize that, that as David said, uh, my soul begins to respond and make her boast in the Lord. Glory to God. That means my mind, my will, and my emotions begin to respond in a praise and thanksgiving to God because he is the great God. He's the good God. He's marvelous in all his ways. Amen. And uh, he is, he alone is the great God. Hallelujah. So grateful tonight uh, to see all of you. And we welcome you again to another encounter and time in the word. Um, in Kingdom Academy, and, um, and we're just going to get started tonight. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. Lord, and even as we heard the song declare that the heavens are telling, the heavens are speaking and declaring to the earth, making the announcement to the earth how great you are. Thank you that even as we reflect, Lord, even on the season, Lord, we have <clears throat> come through how that there was an announcement by the angels made uh, in the earth, even the wise men, uh, as they began to, to witness 
and to testify that there was a birth, that there was a move of God, there was a performance of the word of the Lord that was happening in the earth. And I thank you that even now that we, the earth, is witnessing that time again where there is announcement made, there are this praise that the angels of the Lord are going forth throughout the land <clears throat> and declaring that you are moving in the earth that you are performing your word according as you have spoken it in times past. And we thank you today. We give you praise. We glorify you that we are as those wise men that behold, that hear, that we've been waiting and that we hear the sound uh, that there is a move of God in the earth. And so we thank you tonight that as we gather around this medium of technology, we pray, Lord God, for those who are watching and those who will watch, Lord, we pray that you will bless them, Lord, that you will meet them wherever they are. Father, I pray that you would encourage them, that you will strengthen them, that you will let them know that you are not a man that you should lie, that you do not forget your word, that you watch over your word to perform it, that they will know and be encouraged that this is the hour that you have ordained, the set time to favor and to release the manifestation of your word. We pray for our instructor tonight that as she shares the word of the Lord, we thank you for the anointing that makes teaching easy. We thank you for the anointing that causes our hearts to be good ground, our ears to be good uh, recipients to hear and receive because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And we thank you that as we hear the word that it would activate Lord from in us from faith to faith, from glory to glory that we continually step into and walk in the present truth. And we give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' strong name we pray, amen, amen. Well, God bless you, everyone. Um, without any further um, ado, our instructor tonight again is uh, Dr. Cheney Fabius. And so um, at this time, I'm going to turn the class over to her that she can share with us what the Lord has given her. Thank you. Good evening, Katie and I. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Happy last Tuesday of 2021. We, we, we are we right at the end. This is the, this is the week where we say every day is the last day of the year. So we right at the last Tuesday of 2021. Um, and I was just reflecting on this year and how fast it's gone by but um, just really the place that, that we are as a ministry is really just a blessing to see God's word coming true and um, you know, really manifesting on this side of heaven. So I am going to, we're gonna pick up our discussion about contentment um, today and finish it up. And I, so I'm gonna give a brief overview, just review from last week, no slides today. Um, I can share them with the group me if that's okay. I know um, uh, sister, uh, Evangelist Terry had reached out to me for them, so they might be helpful for others to have as well. Um, but no slides today, so it's just us. But um, just to remind us of the definition of contentment. Does anybody remember what we said about the definition of contentment? Or how would you define contentment? Go ahead, Doctor. I, I remember seeing something when you said internal satisfaction. Yep, so internal satisfaction, which does not demand changes on external circumstances. Some other um, definitions, rest or quietness of the mind in the present condition, satisfaction, which holds the mind in peace, restraining complaint, opposition or further desire, and often implying a degree of happiness. And so if you remember, I um, posed some questions or gave you all some questions to think about um, last week, just for, for ourselves that did not need to be answered with the group, but just for you to think about in your own study time. But the first was, how do I demonstrate contentment in my daily life? What blocks me or hinders me from being content? What can I do to develop contentment? Okay, we discussed content, discontentment being rooted in the flesh. We talked about um, comparison, right? Comparison of um, our current situation to others, our life to others, our money, everything to others. 
um, complaining and not seeing the bigger picture. We also talked about complaining in the middle of things that we prayed for. We're living out prayers and, and complaining. The love of money and listening to outside voices. And then we also talked about ways to exhibit contentment. So setting your priorities, giving, sowing, serving, being thankful, rejecting fear, which is where we'll pick up on. And then the others that folks mentioned were to believe the word, find a scripture that's relevant to your situation and obedience. And so as I was praying and getting ready for today, um, and I was thinking even about the um, word, the prophecy that uh, Sister Tamia gave on Sunday, just thinking about how all of our lessons have sort of been coming together and her encouraging us to go back and reflect. But I was just thinking about sort of what we're experiencing even now um, as a nation, as a, as a world, you know, the resurgence or re, resurgence of COVID cases and mass confusion and all of that all over again. Um, things that our natural eyes and natural minds can't comprehend, but we have to be in a place where we're trusting God at the end of the day, where we're content with what God is doing, not what man's doing, not what culture, not society, but what God's doing. Be content with his sovereignty, that he knows everything that's going on. He knew it before the foundation of the world that we would be seeing this day. And so I think that that's something that this lesson is really sort of driving home. Um, and also to know that we're living the word. We know what the word says about the last days and confusion and, and, and how folks will behave. And so um, just reassurance that God knows. So we're just going to pick up uh, where we left off last time. I know we read the scripture briefly for rejecting fear and worry. But um, I think I kind of rushed through it just because we were nearing the end of the lesson. So I'm just going to read uh, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you be worrying? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass and the field of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom um, and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, oh, hold on, copied and pasted somewhere. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, but for, for tomorrow will worry about itself. There enough, every day, each day has enough trouble on, his own, on its own. So what does this tell us about contentment before I start reading from my notes? What do you all take from that? This familiar passage, but what do you all, um, take from that uh, regarding contentment? Uh, Dr. Cheney. Yes. Um, when you were reading the scripture and talking about the birds <clears throat> and the scripture was talking about how the birds don't toil, they don't lay up. Um, it brought to mind a, an experience that I had some years ago um, when the scripture became um, a more vivid truth, I'll say to me. Because uh, I read the scripture before and, you know, understood it. Um, but this one particular day I was out and um, and just for some reason I felt the uh, unction because um, we had like some bread and stuff in the house. And um, and I was going to get some more bread. We had some left over. I was like, well, you know, it wasn't um, it wasn't bad. Just, it, you know, just a little bit of bread left. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to go get some more bread. And so I was getting ready to throw it away. But then I had this thought. It's like, you know what? Let me just break this bread up 
and just throw it out there, you know, to the birds. And so I went outside, broke the bread up and threw it out. And then all of these birds gathered and um, they started eating the bread. And, um, and just as I did that, the Holy Spirit said to me, this is a picture of what that scripture means. Hmm. Those birds didn't have any idea that I was going to put it in your heart today to put bread out. But I'm faithful to my word and made provision for them. But it was like you, you could see the birds. They weren't when they came over. It wasn't like they, they were um, like, you, you, I mean, they birds, you couldn't tell. Uh, you, but you could just surmise that they weren't stressed or anything. They just they were just kind of walking along and um, doing it usual, whatever. And then when I started throwing the bread out, they came over. Um, so, so um, you know, when you talk about contentment, contentment, and you mentioned about that we have to be um, confident that, that God knows. And um, contentment is not one of those things where um, I'm just contented that God knows, that, oh, God knows about this situation, and that's the end of it. No, the Bible says that they that come to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek them. So contentment says that the situation don't have to change for me to maintain my inner peace, because yeah. I understand that the knowledge of God, um, that God is going to provide and make a way. Um, just like you said, you're in a situation where it might be um, confusion and chaos, but we maintain our peace because we understand that by peace, we overcome the confusion. So the contentment is that I have the peace of God on the inside. It's, it's not like, you know, I'm just content just sitting here, just in the midst of that. No, that's not right. what that means. That means that, you know, I'm, I'm not moved on the inside, um, that I don't allow my peace on the inside, which is the knowledge of God to be taken by the situation. But instead, um, I, I rest in the peace of God. And it is that peace that gives me power over um, the confusion. So um, that's that's why I said, you know, so to me, contentment is um, just like that. You, you stay in a place of peace and rest. And in, in other words, you stay in the knowledge of God. And once you stay in the knowledge of God, just like those birds, what you need or what you have need of will come. God will make it happen for you, so to speak. Amen. Thank you. And I was thinking as you were talking, and I think I, I said this um, last week when I first when I was younger, I used to think contentment meant complacency and like just, you know, like you weren't wishing for or you weren't thinking about more or you were just sort of in a state of laying back and sitting back and letting things happen. And that's not what contentment is when we're talking about contentment um, in God. So thank you. Any other thoughts on this scripture and contentment? Sorry, just one more. Um, just yeah. on that. Um, and contentment doesn't make you a victim. In other right. words, you're not just sitting here just being subjected to stuff. Um, right. But but you know the contentment in which is um, godliness. The Bible says um, is a power, a virtue of God that gives us yeah. power over um, discontentment or disease. Um, not not a um, not only disease um, in terms yeah. of um, an illness, but a dis anything that causes your you to not be at ease. You know, and I saw Mother Hartley uh, take took herself off mute. I just had a quick story I was thinking about. So there's there a group, there's a large body of research on religion and spirituality and how it how um, people who are um, uh, religious or have spiritual beliefs and they don't necessarily have to be um, um, believers and followers of Jesus Christ, but the the, the uh, researchers that conduct this research, and I do not, um, look at like, you know, quality of life outcomes, how people fare and disease and different things like that. And I remember I was in a discussion with um, folks who are followers of Jesus Christ, who are also um, at my job, who also study religion. And they were saying that a lot of times when they present their, their work, people who don't understand mistake contentment and, you know, sort of uh, believing in God and trusting in God for what they call fatalism, like just sitting back and saying, I'm not going to fight. 
I'm not going to do nothing. I throw my hands up and they, they work hard to explain that, that they're not the same thing. And so I think that that's kind of going to what uh, Apostle, you were just saying about, you know, you're not the victim. We're not victims because we believe in God, <laughs> because we trust him, because we have peace with, with what he, what he uh, has for us. Um, but no, that just brought to, uh, back to my mind. We were just having that conversation and it really is something folks just, they cannot comprehend because if you're not fighting, what are you doing in the world, right? You just laying back but our faith says something different. Um, Dr. Hartley, were you uh, gonna say something? Yes, doctor. I just wanted to say, Matthews to me means one day at a time. And live that one day. The Bible says that God gives us grace for each day. I don't know what grace I'm gonna get tomorrow or need tomorrow, but if I can just deal with whatever faces me just today, then I won't be overwhelmed and I can handle it through grace of God. Yeah. Yep. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. And so um, contentment. Uh, no, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. As you know, you were uh, reading the scripture as I was thinking on it, you know, I was thinking on a level of trust and how a level of trust can get deeper and deeper and deeper. And I think about, um, even as Apostle was talking about the birds, like, you know, the birds, they had been through this situation before where somebody threw bread at them. So they knew at some point this was going to happen, you know, not that they knew it, knew it, knew it like that, but I believe that's a level of trust and not to have to worry. And it made me think about how, um, you know, even becoming, um, as a um, believer in the beginning, the level of trust was not the same as it is later. So it made me think about, you know, I believe, you know, the, the more we come into um, communing with our father, then the more trust we will have to actually believe that, you know, you're going to be, um, every need that you're going to need is going to be supplied, you know, because when I think about even myself where I'm at right now, I think, I thank God that I don't, I'm not in the place of worrying about this or worrying about this or how this is going to happen, how it's going to happen. Because all I can say is, all I know is I trust my father and he's going to make a way. He said he shall supply all of your needs. So even when something comes that should not be coming, that, you know, to kind of blindside you, I just have to say, I trust God. You know, Amen. some. So it can be very hard to say that, but I think that's a level of trust when I begin to hear um, that scripture as you was reading it for us, you know, not to worry about what we need because that's how, that's who we know who our father is. He can do these things for us. Amen. Any other comments? Thank you. That was my next point actually, is that contentment requires us to trust God. And so we cannot worry and trust. They don't, they can't, coexist. Um, contentment and faith go hand in hand. So you can't be discontent and have faith in God. It doesn't work like that. Um, or you can't covet as we talked about last week and have faith in God. Um, but one of the things that we were talking about that I was thinking about too is that we talked a lot about last week about coveting and um, sort of jealousy and envy and things like that. I think that also too, that many times our discontentment can be rooted in fear. You're fearful that you're going to lack, you're fearful maybe you've experienced lack before that you're gonna go back to that, you're living in survival mode and trying to do what you can out of your own strength to, to, to make ends meet or whatever the circumstance is. And so there's discontentment that's sort of born out of that. Um, if we think about, for example, COVID, there's many folks that have been living in fear since we heard about COVID it, two years ago now. It's almost been two years. And so just sort of, you know, trying to, to, to scrap together um, and get, you know, barely leaving the house or, um, you know, being afraid to go to work or maybe their, their, their job changed, so on and so forth. There's all these sort of things that feed into that fear. And so you're, you're in that mode of survival and just trying to do what you can to keep your head above water. Um, but you know, if you ever tried to, to talk to someone who's in a panicked mode, it does not work. 
And so God's wisdom can't be downloaded when we are operating in fear or when we're in chaos and our mind is in chaos. God can't speak to us. His, his wisdom, like we, we, we're not paying attention. So if you're trying to talk to somebody and you're trying to calm them down or you're trying to give them instruction or what you know the next step should be and they're all worked up, you, it's like talking to a brick wall. And so we can't hear from God properly. We can't receive instruction if we have that fear literally blocking our ears because the voice is the voice of fear is overriding the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to be very, very careful. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. Anything else about fear before we before we move on? Um, Dr. Cheney, um, mm -hmm. I was thinking as it relates to fear um, uh, in connection with the word trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is something that does not just happen. Um, All right. Trust is built or is developed and cultivated by a consistent participatory action. In other words, we might we might be in a place of fear but it takes a an action of trust god and then when you when you trust him you have to consistently do that just think about any relationship the only way a person can really develop a solid trust in another individual is they they would have had to um been diligent and consistent about something over and over and over enough to the other individual develop enough trust that okay I can I can rest in that they're going to be faithful to this and um and so when we talk about trusting God um the other fact the other part to that trust is to overcome fear that we have to constantly um stay in the word of God and as we stay in the word of God, we see the word of God um, manifested. And as we see the word of God, we stay in it, we obey, we see it manifested. And as we do this continually, what happens is it builds a relationship of trust. Yeah. And um, and it's cultivated. Um, and, and so that's something that, again, is not very, um, it's, it, it doesn't just happen. Yeah. And so we have to build that. And so that's why the enemy comes in with the spirit of fear to try to interrupt that development of trust or faith or confidence in God. And he'll interject something. But if we if we stay steadfast in what we know about God and follow through with that, what happens is we overcome the fear and we build a strong um, trust or confidence uh, relationship, a strong relationship with, with Christ and of trust in faith and confidence to where um, I'm in a challenging situation now, but I built this, we cultivated this relationship of faith and trust. Yeah. And I know even though it's looking, it's, it's not a good situation, but we've cultivated this relationship of trust that I know um, that I don't have to give in to fear because I know that the Lord, you know, that, that contentment is gonna stay in place because I know that God consistently, he's a man of his word. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be yeah. to the ends of the earth. And so, you know, because in, in that moment when, when a challenging situation happens, you know, the enemy try to make you think he's not with you. Yep. But that's a lie because, listen, we built this relationship of trust and confidence and God don't lie. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep walking. Yep. Yep. Amen. And I think, too, that, Apostle, that goes back to your point last week about the word learned in that scripture, um, Philippians 4, where uh, Paul was talking about, I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances, the learning part requires the experience. It's a lesson that you might have had a couple of times in different ways, but that there's been a lesson and something that you took from it. There's been a lesson and something you took from it. And, and he talks about he's, you know, had a lot he's had a little so that says multiple times i've had this lesson and i've learned to be content in whatever circumstance um prophet go ahead 
I was um, just getting ready to say that very scripture in Philippians 4 and 11. And it said, um, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatever state I am in therewith to be content. So uh, contentment is not about having a lot. It's not about always um, having things going your way. Um, having everything um, lining up. Um, the world can be content that way. Um, but this is a different kind of contentment um, that even when things are helter skelter, when things are just going totally opposite of what um, we thought they would be, that to find a place of contentment and to wait on, wait on the Lord in that place of contentment, you know, not to even go with the flow. Because it's very easy when everything's going crazy for you to join right in with it. You know, uh, uh, everything's falling apart and you start talking. I, I knew it, everything was going to fall apart. It's easier to join right in with it. Everybody cussing, so before you know it, you didn't got a cuss word or two. So that's not a place of content. Right. That's, that's just going with the flow. But he said here in, in, in Philippians 4 and 11 that I don't speak in respect of one. I'm not in regard of, I, it's not that I don't have a need, but I've learned that when I have it and when I don't have it, I can find a, a, a place of contentment waiting amen. on the Lord in that place. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Any other thoughts before we transition? So, we are going to spend the last little bit of our time um, looking at an example. Um, and I mentioned last week, sort of the children of Israel, but we're gonna focus on one example, um, looking at uh, discontentment. And so if somebody could get, to, we're gonna be in numbers 11. And if somebody could get from me numbers 11, four through six, somebody else, numbers 11, 18 through 20, and then somebody, numbers 11, 31 through 34. And I just want to preface this by saying, you know, in all that we've talked about, um, we, we are responsible for our own contentment. And we're responsible for our own actions, our own faith, our own belief in God. That's our responsibility as believers um, in terms of what direction we're going to go when circumstances arise. Um, so does anyone have four through six? I have it. Okay, can you read please? Yes, I'll be reading King James Version. Mm -hmm. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish, which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Does someone have um, 18 through 20? I have. Okay, thank you. You shall, then, then you shall say to the people, consecrate over and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it will for it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat, eat, you shall, you shall eat, not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and be become lo lo loathsome to you because you have despised the Lord who is among you 
and and had wept before him, saying, Why did why did we even come up out of Egypt? Thank you. And then does someone have 31 to 34? I have it. Okay. Numbers 11, 31 and 34. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side. And as it were a day, day's journey on the other side, round about the camp. And as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails he that gathered least, least gathered 10 homers and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp and while the flesh was yet between their teeth ere it was chewed the wrath of the lord was kindled against the people and the lord smote the people with a great plague. And he called the name of that place Kabroth Hadava, because they were buried, because there they buried the people that lusted. Thank you. So I just wanted to put a quick note. So, so in some um, translations, thank you all for reading. In some translations in that verse four, uh, Numbers 11, verse four, it, it says that lusting was that the people yielded to an intense craving. That's another uh, translation. And then in the message, ver message version that Kibroth Hatava means graves of the craving. And so it's interesting to read that in a couple different translations. But what are some things that you pick up from this story um, that relate to sort of what we've been talking about? Uh, Dr. Cheney, uh, mm -hmm. that the fact that they were not content with what God provided for them, um, yep. <laughs> that they wanted something mm -hmm. other, and the fact that they um, they was craving it um, speaks to them still being connected um, where they came from, where God delivered them from, as opposed to them want, uh, as, as opposed to them being content with what God yeah. was providing for them um in transition to where he was taking them amen mm -hmm. other thoughts amen dr jane yes it seemed like on my hearing it, it seemed like it was a point where they begin trying to take so much that they got sick of it and then when i'm getting like they when he said uh, about it coming out their nose you know like whatever they were lusting for, it was going to overtake them. Mm. Amen. Even cause, yeah, even cause the plague on them to yep. lust them for so much. Amen. Anyone else? So the first thing that popped out to me was the yielding for the intense uh, craving and the, the lusting for, as Apostle said, what they used, they were used to. Um, we have to be mindful that in craving, crave, the, the craving, the lusting, the coveting that will never be satisfied because there will never be enough to meet that, that need. You might get a little bit of something and then, you know, you say, oh, okay, well, I got that. Now let me turn my attention to this next thing. Or you're looking for more of the same thing. And I, God was teaching the Israelites how to rely on him. And it's just kind of crazy. I was reading, I'm reading, they talking about the, the uh, fish and the onions and the leeks and the garlic. It's like the seasoning too, all of the things you're, but it's, it's like you, you forgot about the bondage part and the slavery and everything else that came with what um, you're asking for. So it's like, I want that same setup, Lord. I want what that I liked from it, but without the bondage, without the bad stuff, like, and that's not how it works, right? And so God was transitioning them into a new place. New means new. Everything that was connected with Egypt had to go. Even the leeks and the onions, 
And if you think about it too, I'm, they're asking for things that take time to plant. Y'all are moving. You, you got to harvest uh, onions and leeks and garlic and those things have to grow. Where do you think we're sitting down? We're on a journey. And I'm trying to take you from bondage to the promised land. But they're complaining about the food. They're complaining about, um, and, and for us, it could be the, the, the lifestyle that we used to live, you know, the, the money we used to have, just anything that's associated with that old lifestyle and complaining about it, but just start overlooking the fact that you were in bondage. You had yet to be delivered. And I've delivered you and there's a lack of contentment. And so, yes, all of those things about craving, coveting, um, we have to be mindful of those things. We have to be careful what we ask for. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about as um, and reading the scripture is how their discontentment as a result of them craving for the food that they used to have distorted the past and it can destroy the future. You even forgot how bad it was in Egypt. It distorts your, your vision. I wanna go back because I want, I want some fish and I want you know everything that I used to have. God was trying to take them somewhere. And there have even been times, I remember when we first moved to Maryland where I was like, I, I wanna go back home. This was good. Lord, we listened. Was that all the test was <laughs> to see if we would come down here? Can we go home now? And he said, no, I'm trying to take you somewhere. And Connecticut was not Egypt by any means, but we, it was time for us to transition. And so the Lord says, no, and I've had to repent for that. The Lord says, no, I'm trying to take you somewhere. So we have to be careful that we don't let discontentment and thinking that the grass is greener on the other side or thinking back to the positive things about of, of, a, of a, a disruptive lifestyle or our past disrupt our destiny and our purpose. Cause let's harping on those things about, oh, it was real good. You know, when I used to be able to, you know just for the, the Egyptians you know, or the, I'm sorry, the Israelites eating, you know the food that we wanted. I'm sick of manna. I'm sick of, you know you know Moses, the only one that could talk to the Lord I can't talk to nobody. We don't know where we're going, all of these different things. But you don't forgot that y'all were slaves. <laughs> it's just like, it's, all of this was to, to, to free you and to free us. And so we have to be careful. We have to be careful. The temptation for what was can't be so great that we forgot, we forget. And then we have to remember that there are consequences to discontentment. So in addition to their discontentment distorting the past, it messed with their future or, you know, it messed with their future because, you know, they asked for um, meat to the point that God said, okay, here, I'll give you meat. I tell Zena all the time, Zena likes candy. She has a sweet tooth. She gets that from Steve. And I say all the time, you eat too much of that Z, your stomach's gonna hurt. And so every once in a while, she might have something and then she's going, mommy, I think I ate too much candy, my stomach hurts. <laughs> and that's the innocence of a child, but we ask God for something and then we don't take into account the consequences. You want you know, money and clothes and whatever it is, but you don't have the resources, you're not prepared to take on everything that you're asking God for. God's giving us exactly what we need. And the people that yielded, it said, to the craving at the end of that scripture died from the plague. They died. They died. So we have to remember the things that we have been delivered from. They might've smelled good. They might've tasted good. They might've held our attention for the time being but they don't compare to what the Lord does for us. They don't compare to his goodness. They don't compare to who he is. They don't compare to the deliverance that he gives us, the grace, the mercy, they don't compare. And so when we're asking for those things, it's like, I, I delivered you, I took you out of Egypt and you asking me for fish? So 
just think about those things. The other thing, last thing about this story, um, contentment reflects an inward trust of God's sovereignty. And this is what the Israelites in this story lacked. So it was, and, it, and they also lacked satisfaction in what God was doing because it wasn't that they knew they were gonna eat. They just didn't want the manna. It wasn't that he wasn't providing. It wasn't that they were going hungry. They just did not want the manna. It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't, it didn't taste great to them. It didn't satisfy their flesh. It was just, it was all right. It was keeping them alive. But it, so it wasn't that they were gonna die without this, <laughs> this fish and this, the meat and the quail, but they wanted it. They had a taste for it. And so they, they, they were not satisfied with what God was doing. Any thoughts? Any thoughts on that? I, I just want to say, I'm really enjoying this teaching. I think it's just so appropriate for the end of the year, um, for this last Tuesday of the month, for us to reevaluate and to um, really look at um, our level of contentment in, in everything, in every area of our life. Um, because sometimes what happens at work spills over in home and home sometimes in church and vice versa. Sometimes our discontentment in church spills, spills over someplace else. And so we need to, um, need to check that and um, find ourselves um, com coming up to a greater level of um, being content in, in whatever situation we are in. Sometimes we bring on our own discontentment, you know, um, doing a comparison, looking at how somebody else is or what somebody else might have and expecting that same thing. And so it brings a discontentment and you really don't have any reason to be discontent. So we have to really examine that, I think, as, as the year closes out, um, to ask God to just search us, you know, search our heart. It, it becomes personal. Yeah. And ask God, have I been grumbling and mumbling over, over things that I really don't have to grumble and mumble about? Have I been so unappreciative of your grace um, that um, I've just taken advantage of it or expected it? Um, when Apostle was talking about those birds, when, when he showed up, they didn't say, about time. You, you supposed to have been here a little while ago. Where in the world you been? They were, they were just, they knew something was gonna that he was gonna provide. And so um, you know, we have to just keep that in mind that God, He always provides in in some way, shape, or form through somebody, He always provides. So we need to just examine ourselves from this lesson um, as we close out. Um, the year to just um, ask the Lord to just search us and and for us to really check ourselves that we don't find ourselves um, mumbling and grumbling because he doesn't like that either. It doesn't right. make him move and it just makes us more miserable. So <laughs> we need to um, just, just really check that. And it's like, you know, I, I know sometimes I, if I find myself getting off into a fussing spirit, I, I just have to stop. It gets on my own nerves sometimes. <laughs> so if it's if it's getting on my nerves, it's got to be getting on nerve on the nerves of somebody else that's hearing it. So I just got to say, stop right there. Yeah, just stop and and pull it in. You know, get get into your word because you you somewhere or another you done fell off a little. Get to your word. Get into some praise. Get into something that's going to pull, pull you back up out of that pit and, yeah. and um, find you, help you to find your way back to uh, contentment. Amen. Amen. And I was even thinking as you were talking um, about, um, trying to see, I think I might've lost my train of thought. I was thinking about, um, I was laughing at you complaining because I was thinking about how I said last week, uh, people will work us up you weren't even worried about the situation and they've talked you up into what you should have, could have, would have done. You know, that's not fair and everything else. But now I remember, I, the, in addition to um, 
you know, what I said about God knows and, you know, being content that God knows he cares, right? So when we are really going through, the Lord knows and he cares. And so I think going to Apostle's point about building that relationship, that's how we become content because I am content. I know that that God cares. He cares about when I'm really going through it. Now, when I'm just kind of complaining here and there and I have to catch myself when I'm really dealing with it, when I'm really feeling like, Lord, what am I going to do? He counts every tear. He knows. And so I'm, I'm grateful that he cares. And I do think that, you know, definitely it's time to really take stock and, you know, reflect on our own sort of lives and sort of what we've been allowing ourselves to say. I saw this, uh, was listening to something the other day that um, said, if you, if what you saw in front of you was a product of what you said, what would your world look like? And so we just have to be mindful about, um, both the words and thoughts that we have concerning our situations. Um, anyone else? And we're going to get ready to wrap up. Dr. Cheney, it's me again. You know, okay. as both were talking and everything, I was thinking on, you know, a little Mimi on the high end with my Mimi on Facebook. I have one that says, um, you know how some of us think the grass is greener on the other side? And it says for, for those of us who think that, we can make the green, grass greener on whatever side we're on. And that makes me think about contentment because um, when we do be un uncontented like that, then it makes the grass look yellow and brown and, and not uh, unhealthy. But I believe when we come to a place of being contented in our marriages, being contented in our work, on our job, being contented at our church or whatever, that we can make the grass as green as we possibly want it. Amen. Thank you. Sister Tania, were you going to say something? Can you repeat the last um, topic? Or the last uh, question? Uh, about from the, the, the scripture? Con contentment no. reflects an inward trust of God's sovereignty, yeah. that one? Right. Yeah, that's what I, I missed it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any other um, thoughts? Deacon Pam? Yes, I, I just wanted to say that um, I, I agree with what um, Prophet Natalie was saying. And um, um, I know that sometimes um, we as people, we have a tendency to, um, um, you know, like compare ourselves to somebody else or um, even have low self-esteem in our own abilities and not, not even realize that the way that we are is the way God wants us to be and not like somebody else. He doesn't want us all to be the same and that um, what whatever whatever is in me is what God put in me and whatever is in someone else is what God put into them. And so, um, you know, in our, in our comparison, it's, it's almost like we're saying that, um, that God, didn't make us right or that he did something wrong in us. And, um, you know, so, so we have to keep in mind that um, we should be um, satisfied with, with um, the way God has made us in knowing that um, we all are fearfully and wonderfully made and that what what we have in us is what God put in us and that we can, um, we all have something to offer in the, in the body of Christ as a whole and no <laughs> one is bigger than the other or no one is less than the other. And that um, we should be um, content in the way that God made us and know that he made us the way he wanted us to be. Amen, amen, thank you. Any other thoughts? So Deaconess uh, did a good bridge to my very last point, which is where does your satisfaction lie? And so I just wanted to end the lesson just reminding us that our satisfaction, our contentment should be with God and his plan for our lives. And I'll just read the scriptures, uh, John 6, 36 and 35, and Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Psalms 
107 and 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. In Philippians 4 and 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I remember, I think it was Prophet Karen last week that suggested finding a scripture that that go that is relevant to your circumstance. And I think that the, these three and many others speak to being content with what God is doing in our lives, with not being, with not coveting not being envious over what others have, not allowing our flesh to rise up and convince us that um, what God is doing is not good enough or he's not moving on our timetable or he's not moving fast enough or slow enough. But um, yeah, I think, um, you know, just in wrapping up this lesson that I pray that this has been a helpful lesson. I know it has been for me, just for where I am in my life. That This is definitely something that I've received first. Um, but I thank God for each and every one of you. Uh, and I am going to turn it back over to the, into the hands of our apostle. Amen. Praise God. Can we give Dr. Cheney a hand? Great lesson tonight. Um, great lesson. Great part great two. Lesson. Um, and such a timely word, <clears throat> such a timely word. Um, and uh, as Prophet Nat mentioned earlier, the one that we can reflect on even as we're coming to the end <clears throat> of this year. And a great point by Deacon is Pam, um, that we ought to uh, see uh, that the value in us, that we have something to offer at the same time we ought to also see the need that we have something we need to change. Yeah. You cannot have one without the other. You must, you must have both. While you have something to offer, there are things that we, we have also um, a need to change. Swatter Bible says, work out your soul salvation with fear and trembling. Um, the Bible says of Jesus that he learned obedience he it was cultivated he practiced it daily until obedience was established in him but he learned it by suffering not by peaceful times and the cross was not the only time that jesus suffered he suffered rejection um, he suffered dishonor um, there were many things that he suffered um, before he got to the cross. So the cross was not the only time that Jesus suffered. Um, and so when we look at his example, uh, again, um, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And so um, we, we have to learn, as Paul said, we learn to be content. How do we learn? We practice um, the knowledge of God and what the word of God says. We practice it until it's cultivated and it becomes established in us. And, um, and we do not want to be like the children of Israel in the Egypt, because that, um, that was a very serious place. I, I was thinking that um, it's important for us not to fight God um, or reject God for what we want. Because eventually, God will give you over to what you want and your desire will be the death of you. I know people say, God, he long suffered. Yes, he is. But I'm here to tell you there is a time in God. There is a time in God. Which is why the Bible says, today when you hear my voice, heart, today when you hear my voice, mean that there's a time, harden not your heart. Don't be like those who were in the wilderness. Um, they died because they did not obey the word of the Lord. <clears throat> they did not have faith to trust in the Lord. And so, you know, you, you think about contentment. We can also be discontent with what God is doing with us, also speaking to what Deacon and Pam said. Because we want God to do something in us that we see being done in someone else. Well, it's not your time, and that's not God's process for you. You have to be content with how God grows you spiritually, even though you might not be at the same pace somebody else is. God's wise. He knows how much we can take. 
And if he was to allow you to grow at the pace that you, you, somebody else, you see your, your desire and what a strong desire to be at, that pace might, that might bring harm to you. You might not be able to handle that pace. So God knows what he's doing. He's not, he knows how to grow you in the timing. He knows what to do in your life that's going to bring you to the truth of the knowledge of who he is in you and who you are in him. That's why the Bible says, let patience have its perfect work. Not only with yourself, but you have to also be patient with other people. And you can be patient with other people when you're content in God. Amen. All right, um, we um, just, just we're getting ready to end our class tonight, but um, once we end our class, I wanna ask everybody to stay on for a moment because there's some things that I, I need to share <clears throat> with, with you all. So, um, so thank you again, Dr. Chaney for the class tonight. To all those that um, are watching, um, that will watch, we decree the blessing and the favor of God upon your life. We pray that this be the hour and the time that you would discern through the wisdom of God, the time and the season that you would know this is the timing of the Lord, that you will not miss your time of visitation, that you will step into what God's called you to. May the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, may he strengthen you as you endeavor to go forth in these last days. Um, just hang on everyone for a moment, please. <clears throat> 